Turn with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 13. As you do, just a reminder of the conference coming in a couple weeks. If you have not signed up for it, the Connect Station is there tonight for you to sign up for it. I know you don't want to miss it, so unless you're in China, uh, make sure you sign up for it. And maybe even some of you could put a note on your sign up that you would like to volunteer if you're able to volunteer. And we know you. Um, please come and volunteer. We're going to need at least a couple hundred volunteers for that conference. Proverbs um, chapter 13, and I, just to make a note that it, it's really important to come to church for the right reasons. And it's kind of like if we put Jesus Christ first in our lives, then everything else about our relationships is strengthened and made healthy. Um, so if our wife is first, or a boyfriend, which you, nobody should have boyfriends, you should have somebody you're courting, who you plan to marry, or nothing. Okay, just so you know, it is not biblical. Um, but a wife, a fiance, a husband, fiance, a, whatever the case, children, if they become our main focus in life, then it diminishes those relationships that are our main focus because we're not getting the strength we need from those relationships to strengthen those relationships. But when God becomes the main focus of our lives, then something wonderful happens in those relationships that are in very important. They become more healthy and they become um, stronger. And it's like that with the Word of God. If there's any other reason to approach God's Word other than the main focus in, 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 in knowing God and being intimate with Him and glorifying Him then it will do damage to you. Did you know that you can focus on the Bible for wrong reasons and it actually hurt you? You can read from Genesis to Revelation and get nothing out of it. You know, there are scholars who do that. There are Muslim scholars who do that. They don't believe in Christ at all. Some of these other cults such as um, Jehovah's Witnessism and with Charles T. Russell, uh, he, he studied the Bible Joseph Smith, I guess you can say he studied the Bible a little bit. He's really a lightweight and uh, demonic, but so th these types, you can read the Bible for really the wrong reasons. And one Bible verse says that knowledge puffs up. That's knowledge without humility. That's knowledge without the pursuit of the glory of Christ and all of that. And, and let me... Do, I, get to the point here. The point is, if you go to church to study the Bible for the wrong reasons, you will get nothing but pain out of it. If you're coming because it's exciting, which other than the focus of glorifying and knowing God, there's nothing wrong with meeting somebody at church that you'll be married to one day. That's actually a good place to meet somebody that you might marry one day. But if that's the reason why you go, it's very dangerous. Out of knowing Christ flows torrents of living water and good relationships. And all, all I, I say that, that when we study our Bibles, we absolutely humble ourselves before the Word of God to submit to it, to say the Word of God needs to encourage me, rebuke me, correct me, and train me in righteousness. And when we come with that humble heart and that kind of focus then we find ourselves actually changing and we find ourselves growing. And you may not notice it after six months of really humbling yourself, but man, when you look back upon the last three or four years, you're like, wow, I am truly not the same I was three years ago. And that's really the ultimate goal, is sanctification in our relationship with God for his glory and for our joy and pleasure in knowing him really is. The Proverbs do that. Now, if I had to 
pick the, I think I've read the book of Proverbs more than any book of the Bible. For, for the reason is that there's 31 of them, chapters, and I read them every day. So that's, it's not necessarily my favorite book in the Bible, though I truly love it. And what we're learning from here is a, though there is some consistency in, in, in like five to 10 subjects, there is hundreds of subjects in the book of Proverbs. And we need to submit ourselves to it to say, hey, am I lazy? Am I um, lustful? Am I making wrong decisions uh, about relationships and so on and so forth? And when we apply the Bible to our lives, you will have honor from the Lord. So that's the exhortation to pay attention. Verse 18, poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honored. And so um, once again, in Proverbs 13 and all through the book, it's, it's, it's talking about what can bring poverty. Now up to this point, we've seen several things that can bring poverty. This is a little unique and, and bringing up a new way that we can uh, grow in poverty, which is actually interesting that it's kind of a unique way, that somebody who doesn't listen, somebody who doesn't take instruction, doesn't take rebuke. But there's been several um, reasons why somebody can grow in poverty. One, and probably the major one in the book of Proverbs, is laziness. And we see it verse after verse after verse after verse. I'll just give one example in Proverbs chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. He who is slack in hand becomes poor, and the hand of the diligent is made rich. He who gathers in summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. And so dozens of verses in the book of Proverbs that speak against laziness and then tell us those who are lazy will come to want. They will be in need. They will have poverty. Another reason why we can come to poverty, the book of Proverbs tells us, is love for pleasure and luxury. Number two, love for pleasure and luxury. Proverbs chapter 21 teaches us that. 21.17 he who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. So a love for pleasure and luxury brings us to poverty. What's interesting, isn't that common sense? <laughs> and as commonsensical as it is, it is still profound. It's like, oh yes, if we go spend all our money on luxury and pleasure, we'll have no money. You have to have self-control. You have to have restraint. Unlike the child, we have to grow up. And what do children spend their money on? Candy, exactly. And you know that. They spend their money on candy. They spend their money on toys. And then they have no money left. Well, number third reason people come to poverty which is very interesting, a propensity to talk instead of getting down to work. Proverbs 14, 23. We'll cover it maybe even tonight, but let me read it just in case we don't. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Also, very profound, but it's common sense. Now, the reason why it's profound is because people don't realize when they don't get to work and all they do at work is talk, then they will have no work. They will be fired. And their intention was not to get fired because they like the paycheck. They do want an income. And that's why it's profound. It's profound because we are so slow of mind and I, I cannot tell you guys how many times I've had to fire people. There was one particular occasion I'll never forget. And, you know, this one guy that actually worked hard at first, probably because um, I was always here. 
And then the job slowed down to a certain degree where there wasn't any more building and we got the trusses in, the walls up and all this. And he just had some labor, some work and even digging holes and stuff. And wouldn't you know it, every time I left, as I was leaving, he was working. Every time I came back, there was no work that got done. Doesn't take a rocket science to figure out what's going on. He stopped working when I left. So one day I was just like, dude, you, I would come. It's like, it's like you did nothing. He's like, oh, this is very hard ground. It's like, that's what he told me once. He goes, this is Miram right here. I was like, yeah, but you didn't dig one inch. He's like, yeah, it's very hard. It's like a rock. Okay. So I left and I kind of swooped around and I got a video of him. And he's like making sure I'm gone. He's like... Puts the shovel down, got on his phone, started talking to, I don't know, somebody. Man, I couldn't even stand it. 15 minutes later, I wanted to see how long he would do it. But 15 minutes later, I couldn't sit there anymore. I got work to do. So I went over. As soon as I pull around the corner, he's like. I was like, hey, idle chatter. You're fired. Leave. He's like, no, please. This is very hard ground. I'm like, no, you have a very hard, wicked heart leave. I, mean, I can't tell you how many times this has happened. Idle chatter. And it's like union jobs, isn't it? It's like government work. It's just a lot of people talking, wasting our tax dollars. So that's a third reason why people come to want and poverty. Fourth reason the, the book of Proverbs has given us is wickedness in general. Proverbs 13, 25 tells us that the righteous eats to the satisfying of his soul, but the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. Wickedness causes us to come to poverty. Um, Selfishness is a very interesting reason that we can come to poverty. And this is a very profound reason indeed. Proverbs 11, 24 The Bible says, there is one who scatters yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than what is right, and it leads to poverty. Now, that's an interesting verse, because it's talking about that generous person who's always giving, who always seems to have something to give, and there is somebody who's always keeping, and yet even what he keeps is taken away from him. This is a supernatural thing. This is the hand of God upon somebody's life. Somebody who does not give of all of their possessions or or all of that they have. I'm not saying everything they have. I said every part of their life, their time, their energy, their finances, their service, everything is to be done generously. And selfishness brings us to poverty because God will not continue to entrust people with finances who are selfish with their finances in in a general sense, you could say. I don't even, uh, I don't monitor our staff, but I tell them a couple times a year that if I find out that one of you is not giving a, a glorifying percentage of your income to God, which is a tithe, uh, uh, to begin with, to your church, Calvary Chapel Elderate, then I don't want them working for Calvary Chapel Elderate. And if I found out about it, it is, so, it, and trust me, I know how merciful God has allowed me to be lately. It, that makes me more angry than theft. I want you to know that. People who are selfish with their money will come to want. And it says it repeatedly in the word of God. Now, I know we don't talk about tithing and offerings a whole lot, but the reason for that is because we do expositional Bible studies. And we bring it up when the scripture brings it up. At least I bring it up just because the tithes and offering is down, which is very dangerous. But you got to understand, the biblical principle of coming to want is also selfishness. And poverty um, comes f- from these reasons we're taught. And, and, and then lastly, the sixth reason is given to us in the verse that we started with. 
It comes from people who do not listen to instruction, who refuse to receive rebuke and instruction. And isn't that so true? If somebody's trying to train you to do the job and you don't listen to them and they have 30 years of job experience in mechanics or in building or whatever the vocation may be, then you will not perform properly and you will lose your job. It's the same thing in the spiritual world. If we are not learning from brothers and sisters in Christ who are more mature than us, then we will come to want, come to spiritual poverty. We will not increase in our Christian lives. And I say this often, but listen, please, if your collective wisdom is from your age mates who happen to be 17 and 18, then you are no wiser than uh, Absalom who drove out his father from the kingdom and ended up dying because his beautiful hair was caught in the trees and then he was thrust through with a sword or a spear by Joab. Oh, isn't it, isn't it interesting? And, and it's very important to find the ironies in life. That what won him, uh, the, the nation of Israel, the general consensus, the constituency, is his beauty is the very thing that killed him as he was running away and he got caught in, with his hair in the trees. So how does poverty come from lack of instruction? Well, I told you already, but it's fascinating. People who just don't listen. If you don't listen to anybody, you are going to find yourself in big trouble. But make sure you're listening to the right people. Number 19, verse 19, a desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. Oh, no, I, I, I forgot something. This does not mean poverty always comes from wickedness. Poverty can come from other means. Um, Proverbs 17.1 says, Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. So don't for a second think that I am poor because I am wicked unless you can trace your poverty to your wickedness. There are other means by which people get poverty stricken and one of those is an extreme tyrannical government that takes all the resources of a nation and spends it on themselves rather than happen in open market uh, with low taxes and so on and so forth. One commentator said, Proverbs takes a balanced position. It neither dehumanizes the poor on the grounds that they are to blame for their poverty, neither it absolves the individual from personal responsibility. So that's very important um, to note. Verse 19, a desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. We, one of the things that really keeps my life in a straight and narrow is for godly Christian goals to be set and to be pursued with all of my heart, soul and mind and strength and energy. And then when reaching that goal, which I have several times by God's grace, it is sweet to your soul. You guys know what it's like to accomplish something, surely. And when you accomplish that thing, you're like, I accomplished it, it was not easy, and some of these goals that we set, there was even the temptation to give up, but I went through it by God's strength and by his mercy and by his grace, and now that it's done, we thank God. I remember when we built this church, it was a goal, it was a desire of mine, and, um, 
And, and Peter and I, we left a couple guys in town, Joseph and, and Ben, and we came and, and we worked. Back then, we worked 12, 15-hour days. We got this entire shell built up in four months. Probably because somebody told me I couldn't do it. I set a goal. And, and, by, and we had other people help us that we would bring in and, and help us. And man, when it was done and we had our first uh, couple church services, it was sweet to the soul. There was a goal set. It was accomplished. Now we got um, other goals. We got a whole city we're trying to build out on the land. And we got now a whole city trying to build across the street, a four-story church. And, and if the Lord allows us to accomplish those goals, it's going to be so sweet, isn't it, church, when we get it done? Set goals for yourself, godly goals, not ungodly goals. Don't sit there and guy and be like, I'm going to play on 10 girls this month. That's not the goals I'm talking about. Set a godly goal. I'm going to read my Bible. Now, I remember years ago, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget one of the guys who was a teacher at the program I was in, a very wonderful man of God. Um, he said, I just set a goal that um, I'm going to every Sunday after church and after lunch and after there's a rest time when my family's resting, I'm going to read a book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He says, some of them only takes 10 minutes. But man, when you get in Jeremiah, you need a good 30, 40 minutes to read that book. And he did it. He set the goal and he And there was a lot of fruit that came, but when he was done with that, it was sweet to his soul. So set goals for yourself and accomplish those goals. But it is an abomination to the fool to depart from evil. They don't, uh, evil people stay in their evil. Verse 20, he who walks with the wise men will be wise, but the company of fools will be destroyed. This is so evident. This this is so proven. If you get a group of people that are fools and you have a little bit of wisdom and you go go join that group, you're not going to go join to change them. You're going to become like them. Don't think for a second. It's like, you know what? I'm going to do some missionary dating. I mean, this... This guy really needs Jesus, and I'm going to be the one that gives him Jesus. And you go, and there's an immature, unproven, unfruitful man who says he loves Jesus, but he doesn't. And you think that you're going to go join that ban mental fool, and no, you're the one who's corrupted by him. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And I've seen it timing. Or a, 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 a person who grows and joins a group of friends. And I'm going to tell you, I can look around, around in the world and just be like, I don't even know that person, but I know what group of friends they're part of. And if they're part of that group of friends, they're not doing well. And I've seen it all my Christian life. You can't really become better at something, including growing in Christ and wisdom, unless you're around people who are mature, who have wisdom. It's the same, not just in the Christian life, by the way, it's the same in everything. This is a fact of life, including sports. I do not allow, I guess I did my girls when they were real young, to win at sports. But now, I don't ever, especially my son, I don't allow him. I destroy them every time. Why? Because if they go play people that are worse than them at sports, they won't get better. If they play people that are better than them at sports, they will get a lot better. I mean, if take uh, table tennis, for example. We call it ping pong. And somebody hits a serve. If, it, if they're playing people who are worse than them, it's like, they'll never get better. Just like, ding, ding. But if they got their dad hammering a Forrest Gump ping pong at them, and it's curving 100 miles an hour and hits the table, eventually, 
After a thousand of those, they're going to hit one back. And now they have grown in their ability to play ping pong. It's the same with sports. I, I, I know it is probably rude, but if I'm playing people that are worse than me all the time at something, I'm like, guys, I'm going to get worse just being around you. I'm done. And I'll walk off the basketball court. Now, I'm half joking when I do that to people, but it is a truth. I know that if I play people that are better than me at sports, I will get better. Likewise, if I am around people who are godly people, who've walked with Christ for a long time, who've read their Bibles through and through dozens of times and godly books, and I just, it it grows me. It increases my walk with the Lord. And you got to do that. Got to do it. It doesn't got to be weird. You don't got to go to people and be like, you know, and I, it happens all the time. I was talking to Jerry about it yesterday. We don't got to go. We get this weird complex like I must be discipled. Will you disciple me? It's like, well, well I disciple you when the word of God says, but if you want to hang out, that's a form of discipleship. Just jump in the car. Let's go have lunch together. Let's go work together. Let's go, f- you know, find a thief or two together in Eldoret and stone them. Let's do something together. Let's hang out. Guys, that's discipleship. I've had the privilege of hanging around many godly men and women. One of the, the great ones in my life is my pastor. I spent a lot of time with him. And it has been one of the single greatest sources of my growth. So please, yes, you can have your friends, but make sure your friends include older people in Christ. Make sure they include that. Who who walks with wise men will be wise. I can't tell you how many times as I was growing in my faith that I would be doing something, hanging out with Ken, and Ken would, he wouldn't even have to say anything. Pastor Ken, I'd be doing something stupid or saying something stupid and I'd look over at him and he'd be like, that's all he'd do. It's like, no, Josh, no good. Don't do that. And... (laughs) I'd be like, no, and then, you know, maybe later I'd be like, hey, why'd you tell me that? He goes, and he'd explain it to me. I can't tell you how many times. Do you know what your friends do when you're doing something stupid? They don't go, don't do that. They join you in the stupid. They join you with the dumb jokes. <laughs> they, they, that's what our friends do. Hang out with wise people. I can't tell you. And, and, and now I'm in that place where Ken does that a lot less with me. And now I'm doing that to people. Don't, don't do that. Uh, oh, is that what you said? Don't say that. And I can't tell you. People are like, why? What's wrong with that? Well, this is what's wrong with that. And they're like, you explain it? And they're like, oh, I'm so stupid. Yes. And now that you can see it, half the battle is won. And here's the, the thing about it. We're all, we're all that way. We all need to grow in Christ. And a fundamental way of growth is being around people who do that. Uh-uh. Does the rebuke hurt? Yes. Does our pride hurt? Yes. Good. If your pride's never hurt, that means you've never been humble. A companion. And, and, and look at this contrast. Look at it. He who walks with him, wise men will be wise, but a, can, a, a companion of fools will be what? Not unwise. Think about the vast contrast. So somebody who hangs out with wise people will be wise. Somebody who hangs out with fools, it's, it's not the, the opposite of wise, which is unwise. They will be destroyed. They're going to be damaged. They're going to be hurt. 
They're going to go through an immense amount of pain because of destruction. So please, develop that, con- con- that, that, that wise conviction of being around people. Hang out with them. Verse 21, evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Evil does pursue sinners. There's going to be bad things to happen to these evil people. The righteous shall, good shall be repaid. Verse 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. So there is this, it, it could be talking about finances, but I think much more because of how we compare money to spiritual riches. Um, there are people, and, and I want to be sensitive on this for a very specific reason. There are wonderful people, missionaries, uh, people who have devoted their entire lives to ministry who don't have money to give over uh, to their, their children, but yet they gave them something so much more valuable, and that is a Christian life, a life governed by biblical principles, and that is much more valuable. So if we do that, it is not just going to be good for our children, it's going to be good for our children's children, our grandchildren. Verse 23, much food is in the fallow ground to the poor, and for the lack of justice, there is waste. There's two different opposing views on this. One is it's actually saying that poverty exists because of a lack of justice, that governments actually oppress their people to such a degree that poverty exists in the nation. Well, that's certainly true, but this other view is probably more likely what is actually being said here, and that is um, much food is in the fallow ground to the poor, and for lack of justice, there is, there is waste. So the idea is poor look at the ground, and they don't get to work, and so nothing grows up to gives them, to, gives them plenty for them to eat and to live on. Um, and justice, for lack of justice, there, there is waste. The, the idea is justice requires them to suffer for their laziness. And in suffering for their laziness, um, there's going to be waste. And, and so I, I forgot to mention in the other view, um, people make the case that every nation on the planet has enough resources for everybody to have enough food. And yet there are nations that uh, have people starving to death, including um, most nations in Africa. But either view, they're both true. We cannot think that socialism or communism is an ethical, moral, biblical way to govern a society economically. It is wicked, it is a moral issue. The lazy person should not be rewarded for their laziness off of the resources that those who work for have to give over to that lazy person. It is simply wrong. Um, So that's not to say that There are not reasons for poverty that would require especially the church to help, and especially women and children. But uh, a man or or woman who who is refusing to work should not be rewarded through government aid. It's a big issue in the world today, by the way. It's huge. So many nations, communist, socialist, And the government gets all this power. They say they're going to help the poor. They don't help the poor. And 80% of the poor that they say they're going to help shouldn't receive aid because they're perfectly healthy to work and they don't work because they're lazy. And this is a big problem, not as even as much as it is in Kenya, though it is an issue and it always has been in every nation, but there is a generation of Americans 
that are so lazy and it makes me more angry than a theft, by the way. And theft makes me angry. And the only reason I'm mentioning that is because we've been getting robbed a lot lately. And I've been guarding my heart against hatred. <laughs> I need to guard my heart with all diligence, you know, out of it springs the issues of life. But even more than that, as a lazy person, oh, I hate it. I, I was just talking to a family member yesterday, my mom actually who my mom, she works too hard. <laughs> she maybe, my mom is maybe the hardest work I've ever known. She'll go 20 hours and then, you know, we're passing out, be like, get to work, you lazy bums, scrubbing a deck. She's a very hard worker. But we were talking about a family member and he refuses to work, this 23, four-year-old boy can't call him a man yet even though he should be a man around 13 14 years old oh, he, he refuses to work so this particular boy th that I'd like to lay hands on he was offered a job by his mom's boyfriend to go and it's um, like installing carpets or something. And you know what he told his mom and her boyfriend? I don't want your job. And they said, why? Because I don't like manual labor. <laughs> I just, not a man. Our Lord Jesus Christ labored with his hands building houses. Let me tell you something about our Lord's hands. They were calloused from mixing mortar and brick his whole life. Our Lord Jesus Christ's hands could smash yours. He was a strong guy. And, he, and, and I'm not kidding. I, I, I've done, I did concrete for years of my life. And my brother, Rick, who does concrete still, and he he did concrete for, since he was a boy. And, and by the time, you know, 10 years into the concrete and doing this every day, m scrubbing, slab casting and all this, you grab his hand, he could just break yours. And, and listen, guys, if, I don't care if this sounds legalistic. I want you to examine your hands tonight. And if you have a profession that does not get your hands hard, then do something to make your hands hard as a hobby. Because it's not cool. It's not cool to grab a man's hands and they feel more lotion-y soft than a woman's. It's not right. God do not create your hands for that. I don't wear gloves on purpose because over the last couple years is really the first time in my life that I, my, a lot of my duties don't require manual labor. I'm more in management. So when I work out, no gloves because I want my hands to get callous for some reason. And there's been seasons of my life where I will take sandpaper and rub them on my hands and scrape them on rocks. And I'm not kidding you. And guys, I don't care what the ladies in this room say tonight, even though they probably will agree with me openly. If they don't agree with me openly, they don't know what they want in a man. When a lady shakes your hand and she feels a softer hand than hers, she doesn't like it. Right, ladies? Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Lazy people should receive the reward of their laziness. Verse 24, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. The word of God is clear that we are to discipline our children so that the 
the rest of the world can't see how big of brats they are. Um, just looking at my notes here. The harm a parent gives to a child by not disciplining their child is the equivalent of hating them even though they have no intention in their heart of hate. When we hate somebody, we injure them. When we hate somebody, we are in the process of destroying them unless that person is mature in Christ. And when you do not discipline your, uh, your child, you are hating them. That's what the Bible says. One writer says it this way. His or her, mother or father's fond affection is as pernicious to him as um, another man's hatred could be if they do not spank their children. So his fond affection for his child and not spanking him is as pernicious to him, as damaging as somebody else who wants to kill them. Do not raise your children without discipline. Um, you 90% of people who don't have children yet, take it tonight and uh, go and get married. We've seen it. We've seen those children who are not disciplined. Have you ever seen them at the stores, guys? Parents? And they throw a fit in, fr in front of everyone. Like, give me the candy! And the mom's like, no, you won't get the ice cream later. And you're like, are you kidding me? Ice cream? <laughs> He's not getting ice cream for 10 years with this fit. I've even, I've, I've, I've picked up on... Different cues. Now, I don't do this often, but I've done it a couple times, picking up on the cue that this poor, dumb woman is a single mom. That's not to say all single moms are poor, dumb women. But this specific one at Tuskies many years ago, and I'm just like, listen, I perceive that you need help here. Would you like me to talk to your son? And she's like, yes, please. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I put this kid up against the wall. I'm like, if you speak to your mom like that again, I will beat you in front of everyone in this store. Do you understand me? Kid didn't make a sound. Now, I, I don't advise anyone else do that. Our kids are dealing with enough. Our kids are dealing with original sin. They're going through terrible times. Many of them don't have fathers. They need discipline. And especially those who don't have fathers, one of the best, if not the best, other than a very godly mom, thing that you can do for your child is make sure they're in a good church where there's a community of believers who are instructing that child. This proverb is basing uh, is based on several assumptions. Number one, the home is the basic social unit for transmitting values. Number two, that parents have those values. Hopefully they do. Number three, folly is bound up in the heart of the child, as Proverbs 22:15 says, the doctrine of original sin. In, in other words, for this to actually be believed in, for us to not spare the rod of discipline with our children, which by the way, that doesn't mean caning them in the back and the neck and the head like they do in Kenya. That means using the very thing that God created for discipline and that is the soft tissue that we call our booties. And that's it. But you understand that you will not want to use the rod for your children if you don't believe in original sin. 
if you don't believe that folly is bound up in a child. In other words, if we believe our children are good, then we won't believe it is necessary to discipline them. No, we believe that we are driving out bad values from their life, at least behaviorally. We pray for their salvation and stuff, but we drive out through discipline those bad values and bad manners. Why? Because they're sinful. And why do you think so many children in our world's generation today are undisciplined because of one of the worst lies in all of mankind's history, and that is the lie that humanity is basically good. We are not good. I have, well, I had five brothers. One of them died in a car accident, so there's five of us left. There were six of us. And we have one sister. So there were seven of us. And then on top of that, I had four stepbrothers. No, three. And one of them passed as well. So um, there are uh, eight siblings still alive today. Out of all of my siblings, do you know can, who got spanked the most? For those of you who know my siblings. Who do you think got spanked the most out of all of them? How dare you? Well, you're right. My mom said I was the worst one and I needed the most spanks. And she spanked me. But let me tell you this. Though we didn't get born again, and and, um, a lot of my siblings are not following Christ, by the way. But even though I didn't get born again until I was 21, you better believe I behaved around my mom. And guess what? Not just around my mom. I've had good manners my whole life in front of others as well. Please, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Madam. I've had it my whole life because my mom was faithful in disciplining me. So I know we've had weak moments before, all of us who are parents, where Okay, it's time to get spanked. You know, and the little, your little daughter's lip quivers. Right, Jane? And you're like, okay. Don't do it again. <laughs> you promise? Kelsey has caught me doing that a couple times. <laughs> One of the times she threw the door open, you better spank her. <laughs> a fourth reason why we believe that this scripture is absolutely relevant uh, relevant and true is the proverb says it will take more than mere words to remove folly. You know the proverb says that in Proverbs 14? It takes more than mere words to remove folly. We have to drive folly out of the heart of a child. And guys, if you spank your children properly without anger and without hitting them in the back, and caning them, but if you do it properly, by the time they're six, seven, eight years old, you don't gotta spank them anymore. You've driven the folly out of them. So it's very important. And lastly, the righteous eats to the satisfying of the soul, but the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. Godliness with contentment is of great gain, the apostle Paul said. The righteous, they can eat and not be in want. But the wicked are never satisfied. And maybe some of you have experienced that. If you didn't get born again when you were super young, but when you came to Christ, you were just never satisfied. And even food itself, you know, you you got to the point where and then all of a sudden your heart changed, you were transformed, you're born again, and you became satisfied with things that you were not satisfied with before. There's an old hymn that after Christ, the grass got greener, the sky got bluer, and the birds started to sing. Have you noticed that? I remember getting born again, and all of a sudden, even as a young man, 
Even at 21, I could sit out and watch a field of grass and just sit there and enjoy it. Or all of a sudden, I start noticing flowers. And you walk up to a flower and you're like, oh, look how beautiful this flower is. Or you're eating food and you're like, I'm satisfied. Or you were completely content without having a girlfriend or boyfriend. These sorts of things happen when you're in Christ. When you're walking with him. Because when you see him, he satisfies you completely. But without him, nothing can satisfy you. And guys, that's why it's so important. Now, you know how big I am on marriage, but understand, I'm big on godly marriages. I'm not big on somebody going around, I gotta get married, I gotta get married. Will you marry me? No. Will you marry me? No. Will you marry me? Uh, No. (laughs) And that's how you young people hug each other. You gotta stop doing it. Really, it's like... I'm not, I, I, and I'm not even joking with this. It's like a lust fest when you come to church sometimes. It, it, and, and as funny as this might look, this is how you guys are hugging each other. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And you walk away. Stop doing that. Give a good hug. It's fine. Just be done. But... It, it, Ladies, you have every right and all the permission in the world that if a guy comes and hugs you that way, to punch him in the throat. And if there is a guy at Calvary Chapel Elderate on his knees, holding his throat, choking, and says, she punched me in the throat, I'll know why, and I'll be like, you deserved it. And... and Along with this, satisfaction, but but going on with this discipline thing, it makes me angry to see men touching women inappropriately. And I know all men do this, and I'm not saying you godly, sanctified Kenyan men, but Kenyan men are rude when it comes to touching women. It bothers me. The guys at the Matatu stage, have you noticed this? And, and they'll even come up to men and grab their arms. Be like, where are you going? I'm like, if you touch me again, I am going to stab you. But the way they treat women is worse, isn't it? And these women, a lot of them go to the Matatu stage alone and they're getting Matatus and and, and they f- they're f- fearful and threatened. I just, I, I, I honestly have dreams of issuing a 20,000 volt taser to every woman in our church. And would it be like the most awesome thing on Instagram for an elder at Matatu stage to watch Calvary women just dropping all the men to their f- knees? Oh yeah, you touched me. That is a dream I have. But men, Calvary men, listen. Don't touch women in the wrong way. Your hands don't belong on their hips. I have seen it before. One guy who's no longer here was putting his hands on the hips of a woman getting off of our GCM bus. And guess what? I was there. And he's like, he's he's driving her off the bus like this. You remember what I did, right? Because that lady's here tonight. I slapped that man's hand when it was still on that woman, like as hard as I could, right on his top arm. Whoops! And I said, if you ever touch her like that again, we're going to have a bigger problem than that. And it hurt. It stung. Trust me. Now, moving on from that, this is the point. If we're not satisfied in Christ outside of marriage, we will not be satisfied with Christ in our marriage. Do not think marriage is going to satisfy you. Now, it will bless you. 
There is fulfillment in marriage. I understand you can be satisfied in Christ outside of marriage and still be lonely. And just so you know, those lonely feelings are very natural. And that's okay. But satisfaction in Christ is very important. But the wicked are never satisfied. They're never satisfied. Just a little more, a little more. And if... the let this be a litmus test in your heart tonight, please. Search your heart. Are you empty? Are you, uh, can you differentiate between is it just loneliness or is it actual emptiness? And if there is emptiness in your life, you need a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ. Not more friends and not a husband or wife. You need him to completely satisfy you so that when you do get married or if you are still married, then you can be a torrent of living water satisfying your spouse, not needing them to fulfill you. Because if you need a spouse to fulfill you, you will take from them what only belongs to God and you won't be able to give to them what they need from you. The grass was a little greener when I got born again. The sky was a little bluer and the birds, I could finally hear them singing. Lord, we thank you for your word and ask that it would shape and mold us and guide us. That we would be convicted by it and we would be changed by it, Lord. And we certainly ask, Lord, that you would be glorified in our application of it. And Lord, I begin to pray now for our conference coming in a few weeks. Well, there'll be hundreds and hundreds, more than even a thousand people come, many from around the country or even East Africa. Many of them are pastors who are preaching false doctrine, and many of them are people who won't be born again. Please, we beg you, God, poor in spirit, your servants, I cry out, save them from their sins. May we actually witness a move of the Holy Spirit, not an artificial move, but please pour out upon us where there will be repentance, both of the believer unto sanctification and the unbeliever unto salvation. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. And uh, have a good week. We'll see you Sunday.